And our final witness of the day is the Baroness. Yes, Jane. Would you like to be known? Jane. Jane. Thank you. Jane Campbell. Take the book in your raised arm, hand, and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Jane, you're a campaigner and advisor in relation to disability rights. Yes, that's correct. And we'll touch on that towards the end of your evidence. But you're here not primarily in that capacity, but to talk about your late husband, Graham Armstrong Ingleson. Yes. And Graham died as a result of AIDS in 1993. That's right. Graham had severe haemophilia A, but he was a very active young man, and that resulted in him having to take a lot of Factor Eight products. Yes, it was impossible to anything that he shouldn't have done. He did from a child all the time that we were together. Climb trees, go up ladders, climb roofs, anything to prove that he was probably to prove that he was not a disabled person. And how did you and Graham meet? We met at Harrowwood College. Uh, we were both um, 16, just over 16. This was a college that was built for disabled people who um, got most of their, well, who had been educated in segregated special schools. Um, and at that time, if you were a disabled person and you went to a special school, you basically did basket weaving, um, rudimentary mathematics, um, what I would call a primary school education until the age of 16. Um, and unfortunately, many of the kids there were very bright, very able, I'm very capable of doing anything that any non-disabled person could do, but because you were a disabled person, um, you were treated differently and offered less favourably. So um, at the time, um, in, the, in the early 70s, um, the education authorities decided that maybe it was a bit not very good that they weren't teaching um, a curriculum to disabled children in these schools. So a special school, a special college was built so that children who had languished in these schools could get a proper education. And um, it was expensive, but I was lucky to get a bursary to go there from my local authority at Graham Wards also. Um, he was at a special school in Yorkshire, and I was in, spe in a special school in Surrey. And we both went to college at the same time, and we were young, we were so hungry for knowledge, and we were so hungry for a life outside the very cocoon environment of a special school that, well, we went a bit mad, really. We just did everything at and I had a, just a wonderful time for three years. And you went out together for three years, but you went Not off... for three years. We probably went out together um, towards the first and the second year, really. Um, I was, you know, I was a bit shy and, and he didn't want to go out with a girlfriend in a wheelchair. So um, 
but it was, you know, we were just finding ourselves as young people. That eventually we got together in the second year and we had a, a tremendous fun. He was a pretty much able-bodied and I wanted a able-bodied girl for a boyfriend. And, um, and I had my eye on him, but yeah, he was my freedom. And um, you then went off to university Yes. But you got together, you and Graham, um, a while later when you met again at a party in London. That's right. And we decided after <laughs> we left, I left with A-Levels. He left with um, A-Levels. He went on to do um, an engineering course in Yorkshire. And I went to university in Hertfordshire. And we were quite mature, really, for that age. But we decided that we needed to go and find ourselves further in the outside world. We'd never been amongst the open community, as it were. So we, we parted, which was the right thing to do. At, and, and I had a few boyfriends, and he had a few girlfriends, and we sort of parted. But we always kept in touch. And um, yet it was, it was about four and a half years later that we kind of got back together again. And uh, you began a relationship again, you moved in together. Yes. Graham provided all of your care. He did, yes. And he was a very talented craftsman, so he also did a lot of refurbishment in your new home. Yes, again, you've got to go back in time and understand what it was like to be a disabled person in the sort of Late 70s, mid 80s, um, there weren't any facilities for us. Uh, there, you could hardly get in, in a cinema or a shop, let alone to find a house or a bungalow. We were very lucky to get a, a council house that was on the ground floor. And um, of course, after being at university and away for quite a number of years. I couldn't wait to get away from mum and dad. I didn't want to go and live back at home. And he and I were desperate to have our own place and to build a life together. And he had to provide all my own care because, frankly, there wasn't anything out there. It was either home care that came in at when they, when they kind of can fit you in in the morning and put you to bed at six o'clock. And... Killing in my pyjamas at six o'clock wasn't much of a life, so um, he basically said, well, babe, it won't be a problem for us. You're as light as a feather and I'm fit, so let's get on with it. <laughs> Although um, he wasn't that fit because he had a lot of bleeds as a result of being uh, quite a severe haemophiliac, but he would, um, just as he put it, jack up every morning so that would prevent his bleeds and so he needed that factor eight to lead a normal life otherwise he would have definitely had to use a wheelchair because both knees would would swell up at it was so so painful it was excruciating so to compensate for that or to, to avoid that he used to take factor eight Quite a lot. Do you know whether Graham was ever given any advice or warning or information about any risk of infection with a virus? No, not till a lot, lot later. Um, he was actually encouraged to use factor eight prophylactically um, because it enabled him to um, gain, seek and gain employment as a, as a heating engineer. And if you're a heating engineer, you really shouldn't have haemophilia. But um, that, as I say, was definitely not going to stop him. He lived life to the full. In 1985, I think your first statement had thought 1987, but we've been able to look yes. back at Graham's records. It was such a long time ago. Absolutely. And of course, I... I well, I, I can say later, but if you, if you like, but I chose to put a lot of it out of my mind. In March 1985, Graham's medical records, or the records that are, that are left, 
showed that he was tested for HTLV-3 and that test was positive. Yes. And he was informed of this looking at his medical records yes. sometime in June of 1985. Yes, that was the first time. But what you've said is that at that time you and Graham didn't really understand the seriousness of the diagnosis. I, honestly, I mean, looking back in hindsight is a wonderful thing, but when you're living in that moment and you've, you've had such a protected life and people have always looked after you and always told you what was best for you, and unfortunately, that's what it was like for disabled people. Um, and they told you what was best for you. They told you what they thought you should know and what they thought you shouldn't. So when Graham had the first results, and I was with him, um, they just said, oh, you have tested positive. Um, your test was positive. <coughs> um, but it's nothing to worry about. I remember this thing that you said. It's nothing to worry about because it's not the same kind of AIDS that you're hearing about on the news. It's different for haemophiliacs. And I, I do remember that distinctly. And so we kind of said, oh, well, that's good because we're going to get married soon and, um, you know, it will be fine. And I said, we'll call you back if we have any other news. And they didn't call us back. And we kind of got on with it. To be honest, maybe, maybe... We put our heads in the side, but we were just so keen on getting on with life and being together and building this home and doing all the things that we'd been prevented from doing for so many years. We were quite similar. And you've said in your statement that you and Graham didn't make the link to the AIDS virus that you would read about in the press, because that was primarily discussed in terms of affecting the gay community. That's right. And again, you know, I know so much more now. I'm such a different person now. I often can't believe that I didn't realise that that was ridiculous. But I suppose I just believed the medical profession. They said he'd be all right, so he would be all right. And Graham's consultant at the time was Dr Savage yes. at St Thomas's. Yes, and right. they had a good relationship and, and Graham reposed great trust in him. Yes, he was as crazy as Graham. I mean, he was mad. He, he really lived up to his name. I remember Graham laughing and us joking because he used to come in in a white coat with blood on it all over it. Um, because he thought that would be a really good joke for the haemophiliacs. And, and he was a really, really interesting and, and lovely man. And, and he, I remember later him saying to me, you know, they're killing my boys, I can't believe this. I told them, I told them. And he was very, very distressed about what was happening to what he taught, said were, were his boys. You and Graham got on with your lives, um, uh, and you say this in the same way that we'd always minimised our disabilities, you got on and tried to have a normal life. Yeah, I mean, that's what we were all about. Um, I think you have to understand the psychology of disabled people at that time. We were... We were trying to prove to the world that we weren't that we weren't other people, that we weren't um, that we we were capable, that we were we were just ordinary normal human beings. And the stigma made disabled people to hide everything. We we hid our our impairments, we hid our difficulties to everyone so that we could get a job or so that we would be allowed in a pub because at that time it was still lawful um, for people to, for, for publicans or, or, or restaurant owners to say, you can't come in here, you're disabled. 
I don't have the facilities for you. And um, that was that was ingrained deep inside our our psyche. So we were we were quite we were we, we sorry we were rebelling against our stigma. So yes, everything was to, to be devised. And even as a hemophiliac, a, a person who went to enormous excruciating pain when he had bleeds, he would just get on with it and he would never complain. And that was the way that we lived our lives. Don't take any notice of your pain or your illnesses. Just concentrate on living. And you got married in June of 1987. We did. But sometime in around that time, in 1987, Graham was asked to attend a further appointment at St Thomas's. What can you recall about that? That was terrible, really, because it was... I don't know how many months before we were married. It seems like it wasn't long because two very bad things happened to me within a space of a few months. Um, My father, Graham, was told for the second time about his diagnosis and my father was later killed in a car accident. Um... And we were about to get married. And it was all within that year. I, I remember that. I remember thinking, no, this is wrong, this is meant to be the happiest day of my life. And it's all going a bit wrong. And so we went for the second appointment we were. We were recalled. Um, And it was a long time after we'd had the original test results. And they called us in. And it wasn't Dr Savage. And we were taken into this room. And... And... There was a pot plant, and a box of tissues, and a new doctor. And a nurse who later became our friend. And he said, "Um, I've called you in because I'm reviewing all the, all our hemophilia accents who have contaminated, to have got contaminated through the factor eight products. And he then went through it. And it was almost, it was almost unbearable to hear. And he told Graham very calmly, very, which seemed at the time, but I'm sure it was the only way that he could deal with the situation, but very coldly, very professionally what he had, that it wasn't different to any other AIDS, that it was exactly, although HIV, that it was exactly the same. And he told Graham that he would probably get quite ill, that he would get chest infections, and he would have other, other complaints that they did not yet know what they would be, but they would, they would come. And that, um, that there was a, there was a drug that they were trying, and that they wanted to put Graham on it. And then he told Graham all the side effects. And I just remember feeling the room was getting smaller and smaller. And um, then Graham asked one question. And I know he only asked one question because he couldn't, he didn't speak through the whole thing. And he just said, am I going to die? 
the doctor said yes. But we left and nothing was the same. In terms of practical advice or support at that time, you've said in your statement that the advice that was given was that Graham could approach the Haemophilia Society, that you should use protection during sex and to keep away from open wounds. And other than that, in a discussion about the, the drug, which was AZT, there wasn't very much else in terms of any practical assistance or support. There was nothing. There was nothing. At some stage... Uh, and the, we don't have sufficient records to identify when, but at some stage later, Graham was told by a doctor that he'd also been infected with hepatitis C. <laughs> I mean, that was like... When that was told to us, if it was told to us, I honestly can't remember. It was certainly not something that they sat down and went through with us, we didn't even know what hepatitis C was. <laughs> you have to remember, we were so young, not just in age, but in experience. We'd, we'd been cocooned for so many years, we were only just beginning to live. So we... I mean, you're... I... Jersey, Anita. Anita. Annette earlier was speaking. And I'm sorry, Annette, if you're still here, but I left because I couldn't really hear your story because it was um, too much. But I wish I'd had Annette's fortitude to ask more questions and get more information or even thought to ask the questions that, of course, I wouldn't and I don't know. But things were so different then. So, no, hepatitis was not part of our thinking or questioning. We were just trying to deal with the enormity of HIV and what that meant. And, of course, at the time, we, we still tried to tell ourselves that there would be a cure and he would be fine. I don't think either of us could really quite take in the enormity of what the doctor said that day. It took a long time. Actually, when we left the hospital, we didn't speak. And we couldn't speak about it for a long time and probably never properly. Graham did start AZT. Yes. And the side effects he experienced were so bad that he often considered coming off it. Yes, I, I don't know other people's experience, but AZT was a disgusting drug. He used to throw up a lot, um, um, practically every day. He would feel desperately tired to continue on. As a heating engineer, it was, became harder and harder as, as the months went by. And sometimes I think if the, if the HIV virus didn't kill him, then AZT probably contributed to that. Because he was never well after taking it. And in a way, to get hindsight, if he knew what he knew now, he probably wouldn't have taken it because it made his last few years, the quality of life for him after AZT was absolutely atrocious. And he was such a well person before that. You know, he was a big hunky Yorkshireman, you know, he used to go and work with his dad on the grocery store and on the farm before that. After AZT, he, he completely changed. You've described in your statement how over the years that followed, 
physically he became more tired, frailer, thinner. When you married, he was 14 stone and strong, and he used to be able to hold you in the air with one hand. Yes, he would throw me in the air, he would pick me up out of my wheelchair, and we, you know, we danced around the room. It was, as I said, he was my freedom. And he was like a big bear. And it was just horrible watching it. It's horrible. He lost over half his body weight in the years that followed. He did, yes. And the effect on him mentally and psychologically, what was that? He completely changed. He was completely without fear. And as I knew him before, when we were courting, as he used to go courting, um, he was very fun loving. He adored his family. Everybody loved him. It was quite annoying sometimes. But, you know, everyone loved him. They go, stop nagging him, Jane. He's too lovely. And he was, he was just great. And I was kind of like, fiercely um, into my work and my career. We both campaigned um, for disability rights together. Um, he was just a huge man from Yorkshire. He had the most beautiful Yorkshire accent. We used to go up on, on, the, uh, on the moors in Yorkshire. Um, it was a life, it was a dream life for somebody who'd been in a wheelchair and had not really gone anywhere or done anything. With him and the two of us together, as he used to say, your brains are my brawn. We can do anything. That's it just, it all changed. He, um, he lost what you've described as his positive and sunny outlook. Yes. He became depressed and he became terribly worried about what would happen to you. Yeah, that was the hardest part, I think. But, you know, we were just about to get married and we were so close and... That one injection, or, or however many it was, that contaminated us. It contaminated our marriage, it contaminated our relationship, it contaminated everything we touched. And also, we couldn't tell anybody. That was the worst. I couldn't even tell my dad. Slowly... Graham was able to work less and less and you became the breadwinner mm -hmm. and that dependence financially on you was hard for him because you say he was a proud Yorkshireman and it was crushing for him. It, it really was. And, you know, I tried to not let him feel that way and, you know, and I'd always tell him that there's... I couldn't do any of this without him. I tried to, tried to make life as, as nice and comfortable for him as possible, but it was really hard to work. And also, you know, I was, I have a progressive impairment, so I was getting weaker just because of my, my disability. It's part of my condition. So when we first knew each other, I could cook and I could wash up and he would just be the one to pick me up and put me to bed and but he didn't have to do that much but as his condition deteriorated mine was deteriorating at the same time but I knew we had to I had to work because we didn't have any money um, we were actually quite poor and he became too unwell to continue being the provider of your care. Yes. But you found it hard to find carers to come in and assist you, in part because of the stigma of AIDS, and you didn't know whether to tell people or not. That's right. I mean, I remember um, the nurse who supported us, a, a, a really good woman, 
called Chris Harrington. She said, you don't have to tell anyone. You know, they're not going to hurt themselves as long as they, you know, they just look after you. Um, I, as, I don't know if I put it in my statement, but I was also tested. And, um, I was tested to be, um, to not have, you know, I was, I was negative. Um, <coughs> of course, when we realised the second time that it was the real, the real Mackay, then, um, then that killed our marriage too. So I don't think I would have been any danger to them, but I didn't know if I should or shouldn't. Um, I felt that they would find out sooner or later, and so I chose to tell people, and mostly they didn't want to work for us. Um, but not only that, um, carers, statutory carers at that time, wouldn't come at the time you needed them in order for me to go to work. So I had to find people to that I could pay myself personally out of my salary to come in to assist me. And that's why I decided to campaign for community care direct payments because there were disabled people all over the country who were having to do what the services told them, which was preventing them from having employment. And I had been campaigning on this for some time and that fortuitously came into force towards the kind of end of Graham's life. And I was able to have some money from the social services to employ my own PAs. But it was really hard. So we had actually very little support and Graham would struggle to help me and I would struggle to help him. We struggled, struggled on together, really. It was hard. Sometimes. Could I have a drink? Sorry, I don't That's normally right. cry. <laughs> Sometimes you've said in your statement, Graham would be too unwell even to make a cup of tea. Yeah. You were unable to, and the two of you might sit there for hours without a drink. Yeah. It was really tough. And when you did have people coming in to assist, particularly as Graham himself grew iller, there was the additional difficulty of there being strangers in and out of the house for Graham. Sometimes he couldn't find his way to the door to open the door as he would intermittently lose his sight. Yeah. That was the darkest time of our life. Um, yeah. And I've only got uh, one mum who was getting older and I didn't want to... Um, I didn't want to burden her, and my sister was travelling all over the world, so it was, uh, I think it was the loneliest time of my life, yes, it was very, very lonely. It was, uh, it was, and I was getting angry as well, <laughs> and it wasn't coping very well. At that time, it had been about three years. So, you know, weeks of that, it was you know. Graham's health continued to deteriorate. He got regular chest infections, which would sometimes lead to pneumonia. Yeah. Uh, seizures, 
constant vomiting and headaches. And you've described in your statement that he had a series of lengthy hospital admissions in St Thomas's. On one occasion he had sepsis and you thought that he was going to die. Yes, he was covered in, covered in tin foil and I was called by the hospital. Luckily, I worked in, in County Hall. I worked for the GLC at that time. Um, um, or was it Camden? I might have been at Camden by then. I, I was working in local government as an equality trainer and advisor. Um, and I was called at work at... And then I had to try and get to a cab to the hospital, and then I'd be at the hospital. And that day I didn't know whether he was going to live or die. And I didn't have anyone with me. I couldn't get in touch with my family. Graham was discharged home on that occasion after 10 days in what you've described as a desperately weak state. You explained to staff that you weren't able to look after him on your own because of your own disability and you've said nobody seemed to care that we were both severely disabled and in need of help. It was extraordinary when I think of, when I think about it now. I'm sure that wouldn't happen now. But at that time it seemed to be common. You know, they thought that some... I must have people looking after us. They wouldn't believe me. For the last four months of his life, Graham was confined to bed. Yeah. And fewer and fewer people came to visit him when it became known he had AIDS. Yeah. Although one of his best friends, or his best friend, was there as a friend to the end. Oh, he was wonderful. He was a wonderful man. Well, he is a wonderful man. I, he is also a haemophiliac, and he known Graham since they were at college together. They were both mad and crazy, and they were very, very close. And he was, luckily, didn't get contaminated, because, as he used to say, I've got pig's blood. In me, I'm never going to get your disease. He used to tease Graham about it. Um, they lived together, actually, as flatmates when Graham came down to, to live in London. Um, and he... He was a tonic to Graham, and, and they were able to talk in the way that I couldn't talk to Graham. Graham had a brother, Anthony. Yeah. Anthony was also a haemophiliac, and Anthony was also infected with HIV through the use of Factor 8 products. Yeah. Can you tell us what happened to Anthony and how that affected Graham? Well, uh, Anthony... Must have, well, I don't know whether he was infected a little earlier than Graham. Um, he went to another hospital. It's the hospital where I believe that Graham might have got infected um, because Graham had a car accident when he was visiting them. But going too fast, of course, because he was like that. And he ended up in, in Newcastle Infirmary. Uh, I haven't the evidence, but I have a strong feeling that that's where he started. I don't think we can get any evidence. The hospitals, I did try to get far more evidence when all the inquiries started, but stupidly, after Graham died, I... I binned it all because I was so angry. I just wanted to get a shot of everything and anything that reminded me of that time, which I regret so much now. Um, and Anthony had also been treated there. But Anthony had been treated in, in Newcastle for a period. And um, he was younger than, than Graham. He was the baby boy. And he just got married a year um, or two earlier. And he had a little girl. Um, just was about to have a little girl when it became known that he had also been infected. And he 
started getting ill before growth. And so they both did the same. They both tried to ignore it, but when they couldn't ignore it any longer, they started talking to each other. And um, I remember Graham saying to me that it was unbearable watching, not only watching his brother die, but he was watching his future. And that was, that was a terrible thing. It's, it's affected him very badly. The family told people that Anthony had cancer because of the stigma of AIDS. Yes. You know, they lived in a small Yorkshire village and at that time it was awful and a lot of haemophilex were getting and, you know, were getting hate mail and, and people were being really very nasty towards them yeah, and the stigma was the worst of being disabled. <laughs> So it was a bit of a double whammy, really. Um, so they decided that they would, they would say that he had cancer and they almost believed it themselves. I mean, his mother really could not cope. Um, it was her two young sons. And I know that it affected the whole family very, very deeply. You and Graham went to Yorkshire to visit Anthony when he was very ill and the brothers were able to spend some time together talking. Yes. When Anthony died, about a year before Graham, mm -hmm. you've said the funeral was particularly hard for Graham as he was watching his future. Yeah, by that time he was pretty ill. But we had a wonderful bath who came to drive me to work and he became very close to us and he took Graham up to see um, to see his family. I paid for my driver to drive Graham around at the end because otherwise he, he just wouldn't be able to get out of the house. So it was all, it was all, I had to work harder because and more because to pay for all the extra things I wanted Graham to have in the end of his life. Although by that time we had, we had been given what they call an ex gratia payment from, uh, from the government, which I was so furious about because I personally, being in the business of equality and justice, wanted to fight for his rights in court. And we did start proceedings, but he was getting worse and worse. And, and they were, we were being told that if we didn't, if we accepted the money, we wouldn't be able to continue with any court case. And we had to sign something to say that we wouldn't take it to court. So we... We thought about this for a long time, and, and I said, you know, it's Graham, you know, it was for your choice, it's your life. And he said, well, well, look, like, we need the money. So we took the money, but it felt, it felt like blood money. And that's what you and Graham called it, I think, blood money. We did, well, it's not anything else, is it? <laughs> Graham... <laughs> died on the 19th of December, 1993. Yes. And he was 34 years old. You yes. said in your statement, we endured five years of torture at such a young age. No one can imagine what that does to your spirit and mental health. And it was so much worse for Graham, who bore it so bravely and with such grace. Yeah, he was like... What people would say, I suppose, he, he was the model patient, he never complained. And he suffered in silence. The thing is, there was so much silence, it was unbearable. But he was so, so courageous, I can't tell you. 
how courageous he was in light of the most terrible things ha happening to him. And knowing, he said, you know Jane is a cover-up. You know that this shouldn't have happened. He knew, he knew that his life would have taken another course had he not had the fat eight. And you'd had very little by way of practical support over those years. The two professionals you've identified in your statement and you wanted to mention with your GP, who you said was a fantastic support. Judy Mumby, she was absolutely brilliant. And she, she supported us at home because the one thing that Graham did not want, and I promised it would never happen, he did not want to go into hospital and he did not want to die in hospital. And she enabled us to get through those last few months um, without having to go to hospital. She was amazing. And Chris Harrington, who, goodness, if it wasn't for her, I don't really know how we would have survived. And she stayed with you during the 24 hours in which Graham died? She did. She was... She and I were just together. And, um, yeah, I, I... I... I really can't talk about that time. After Graham's death, you began to experience panic attacks and you were diagnosed <coughs> after a while with post-traumatic stress. Yeah, that's what the panic attacks were. Funny enough, I went back to work and, and I just behaved as if nothing had happened because that's what you do, you know? Especially as disabled people, you, you swallow the, the rubbish and you carry on. Um, and I remember I was about to give a, a big speech to disabled people at a rally in Trafalgar Square. So there's this huge audience of hundreds and it was something that I could easily do when I was campaigning on the behalf of rights of disabled people. But, um, and so I was about to go on the stage and suddenly I thought I was going to die. My heart just kept pounding and it's like and I couldn't breathe and, and I was so afraid but I didn't know what I was afraid of because it's only a speech I've done hundreds of them. And so I just shot off in my electric wheelchair and hid, hid behind the car. <laughs> and um, someone came to find me and I was just a, was just a complete crazy woman, just, just crying and couldn't stop crying and I was so afraid and I was shaking. And that was the first one. And then they came, fast and furious. You had to take in the end some 18 months or so off work. Yeah. Um, and you were living on your own deeply depressed and financially very poor. Yeah, although my mum and sister were great, they, they helped me as much as they could. And you've said in your statement you felt scared, you couldn't sleep, you felt unable to leave the house, and it was ultimately the support of your mum and sister who helped you through that darkness. Yes, and, and my friends, and one particular person. You were eventually able to return to your work and continue your career. Yes. And a number of years after Graham's death, you remarried. Yeah. And you've said that you know that Graham would be happy for you on both counts. Yeah. I mean, I'm so lucky. I don't normally cry. I'm normally a very jolly person. And I'm... I feel... Although it was a terrible... Terrible thing to do, and I have lots of regrets and lots of things I wish I'd done. And I still have times 
And, um, I, well, this inquiry has, hasn't been the greatest, but it's been the best, which sounds ridiculous, but I so want the truth because I believe that if we have the truth, then I won't feel like this. I mean, goodness, it was 30 years ago, but I still can't talk about Graham without going into this squeaky voice and all these tears coming out my eyes and feeling that and thinking, oh, goodness, I hope no one at work sees this because I'm not this kind of person. I'm not very really composed and, and I'm very bloody-minded. You have to be in the house of Lords, for God's sake. I'm dealing with Brexit. Um, but honestly, that's... That's nothing to what, to what that time was. It was so dark, it was so horrible, and he was so brave. Um, and I can't actually mention your question, <laughs> sorry. Don't worry. The, there were two particular points you wanted to talk about. Yes. One was in relation to the McFarlane Trust, and the position of women who were the wives and partners of haemophiliacs who gave up work to care for their husbands or partners were often widowed but weren't recognised by the McFarlane Trust. What would you like to say about that? Well, I'd like to say, in relation to women, I'd like to talk about that first. Um, and it struck me, actually, when I came today, it's the first time that I've heard a woman partner, wife of a haemophiliac or somebody who was infected. Um, that's why I couldn't stay and listen to all of it because I thought it was just, it was touching upon so much of my own experience. And, and I'm sorry for that because um, I, I wanted to be there because I wanted to hear it. But, I knew I was going to be giving my own evidence and I didn't want to start a wreck, even though I probably ended up well. Um, but what you have to understand is that as a disabled person, you are treated less favourably. If you're a woman and you're a disabled person, you're dealing with a double discrimination because um, women are, in my view, <laughs> were, certainly at that time, treated differently to that of the men. So I was just seen as a supporter and a carer. Um, and as a disabled woman, it, it was never recognised that, that probably I you know, as women, as partners of, of, of haemophiliacs and other people with contaminated blood um, illnesses, that we, we had to live through it with them. Um, we had to, to provide a lot of support, both um, physically and, and economically. Um, and we were there all the time, but nobody ever asked us, you know, um, if they could help us, if there was anything they could do to, to help us help them. Um, we, it was never recognised that we had to, to not be with our loved ones when we should have been, because we had to work. Um, and because... It was deemed that the women would look after. In my case, I only knew the haemophiliac community, which were largely men, but the women looked after the men. Um, and Graham got little enough support as it was. When we applied for, what, I don't know what they called the fund, but it was, yeah, well, it was the McFarland fund. But it was like applying for disability benefits. You had to say why you want it, 
it, um, you had to justify everything that you wanted and some things that you couldn't explain it in financial terms. Actually, all you wanted was a bit of support. No counselling was ever, ever offered. Nobody ever sat down and went to us and, and explained to us more about the actual illness. Um, nobody ever told us that it was possibly contaminated. We got all that information from the news. Nobody, nobody, not in the medical profession. Um, sorry, within the NHS, it, there was just a code of silence. Um, and we tried to find out as we started the uh, proceedings against um, those responsible for the blood products. Um, the evidence just wasn't forthcoming. And it was then that we began to realise, oh, <laughs> there's a big cover-up going on here. Because that wall of silence was enormous. And as a woman, and as of women who were there for our men, our hemophilia men, we were never really recognised for or supported for what we had to do. And, you know, of course we would do it. We loved them. But, my God, did we need the support. And I just really wanted to say that a bit, half of all the women and the mothers in this room and out there, you know, well, sisters, you know, it was rubbish, and you're, you have a right to feel angry, and you have a right to feel unsupported, because you were. So that's what I wanted to say about the role of women in all of this. Um, the other thing, what was the other thing? The second point I think you wanted to mention, and you've touched on it in part in your evidence already, it was the particular position of haemophiliacs as disabled individuals. Well, I just wanted well, to touch upon that early, earlier. I mean, I'm in the business of disability discrimination. That's, that's my profession. Human rights and equality. Um, it, and the Equality Act and equality in the laws. The right, you know, the rights of women, the rights of all those groups within society who are discriminated. That's what I do. That's why I'm in the House of Lords. And the more I learnt about this, and the more I learnt about myself and my own oppression and as a disabled woman, the more I began to understand about what happens to haemophiliacs in the 70s and 80s and 90s. A lot of them went to special schools. A lot of them were treated like children. A lot of them were not even treated like in the way that they would have treated an able-bodied adult. Um, I have experienced that myself as a disabled person in my relationship to the NHS, when they tried to give me a DNR, um, when I had a chest infection in hospital once. Because, as they put it, well, in her condition, you know, it would probably be in her best interest. Um, and I feel at that time, hemophiliacs were treated differently because they were disabled people. They were not given the information that they were deserved. They were not told things because it was felt by the medical professions that actually it would be better if they didn't know. I know that to be true. And they didn't want them to stop taking the blood products that they knew were infected um, or were possibly infected. This is a rumour. Of course I don't have evidence of this. But it's, I've heard stories from so many haemophiliacs now that it's confirmed in my mind that 
they were treated even less favourably than somebody, anybody else, because they were deemed disabled people and disabled people who were going to die early anyway, or, you know, this will, this will be better for them um, than not giving them infected blood because they're going to die anyway. Um, so I believe there was a strain of disability discrimination at large at that time. So it's complex, and that's why this inquiry is so important, because, and you're so important, and why it was, I was so happy when the government finally decided, and, you know, there's not a lot I can thank Teresa to me for, but my God, I thank her for her decision to do this, because it was the best thing that she ever, she ever did. It was a courageous thing. It was the right thing. And it's something that no other government did before because they felt it wasn't worth it. But she did. Maybe it's because she was a woman. <laughs> so that's why it's complicated. And that's why I wanted it to be mentioned. Jane, those are the questions I have for you. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Just a few things. Absolutely. I'm just going to get my notes. Firstly, I wanted to apologise to the campaign to get this inquiry up and running and they've been fighting for a long, long time. For a long time, for probably over 15 years, I, I didn't do anything. I hid, I hid the fact that this was something that had happened to me yet because I just couldn't bear to do it anymore. And I know that I probably could have used some of my campaigning skills to help um, the campaigns that are brought about. For a third time this inquiry today, I, I supported um, Lord Morris, who, who um, was in the Lords with me. I've been in the Lords 10 years behind the scenes, but I never felt that I could make any um, personal commitment. Not just because it was so hard, but I just didn't want this tragedy to define me and my work. Because my work is really important to a lot of people. And, and I apologise for that. I decided, when I decided to give evidence to this inquiry, I decided it was time to do something. That, so I hope by giving this my statement and by writing an article in the Times today and by going on Radio 4 recently, it's helped to raise the profile of the inquiry and that it will do some small bits of help to help the, those still living with HIV to get the justice they so, so rightly deserve. And I hope it will help in some small way to get to the truth because I think if we just have the truth then a lot of us are going to feel a whole lot better. Um, and if that's, if that's all we get, that will be... That would be absolutely fantastic. Um, so I wanted to thank Phoenix and for those other families and campaigners who, of people who have also suffered um, hepatitis and other really horrible illnesses as a result of being infected. You know, 
I'm with you and I've always been with you and I'm sorry I wasn't with you earlier. Um, I wanted to thank the, this inquiry in particular and the chair who has been brilliant at how he's enabled all of this to happen in such a different way to the other two inquiries and I I can only wish you the very best and I know you've got a hell of a lot of work to do. I know that there are probably millions of bits of paper to go through and I, I just, if I can help you in any way, then, then you know where I am. Um, I'd like to thank individual people, just a few. Um, one is Robert James, who actually wrote to me this morning after reading my witness statement this week and he told me the name of the haemophiliac from the Birch Grove group um, and am I allowed to mention his name he's dead? I, I'm afraid I don't know it's probably best not to but you can okay. perhaps provide us with that I, information I, I want to just thank, thank James for telling me his name um, because and what happened to James, because that was a, a really wonderful thing to do. To, to, and I wanted to thank Chris Harrington again to, for being the person who, who got me through most of that time. And this inquiry is indispensably important for those still living with the effects of contaminated blood products, but it's also vitally important for all of us who support it, especially the women infected loved ones during their period of deep suffering. The effects of that trouble many of us, even decades later, but this can be helped if the unresolved questions of why and when of how, why, and when are answered. I don't know about anyone else, but for me, the personal facts of secrets and lies has been deeply upsetting, and it still haunts me. And I absolutely know that the truth will enable me to finally make sense at that time, and I, and hopefully, hopefully, I won't feel the darkness which hangs over a huge chunk of my life. And um, and lastly, I just want to say, if you knew Graham, um, and I don't know, but I gave you some photographs and I wondered if you were going to use them. I'm sorry, Jane, I haven't seen those, but we can, in, we can make that part of the record of your evidence. That's good. Because if you look at the photographs of Graham when he was alive, you would know that he absolutely deserves justice, even though he won't be here to see it. He deserves it. And I want the same for all the people, every single one of the people who had his journey. Um, he was the most fantastic human being and he was just beginning his life and so enjoying it so yeah justice thank you very much thank you well you you thanked us um can i say that you've described yourself as a wreck that's one thing you most certainly are not <laughs> uh, and if you hadn't uh, occasionally cried, I would have been really quite surprised what you had to tell us. But it, for me, uh, it's been humbling uh, listening to you, and for all of us, I think, a privilege. Thank you.
Well, that is the, the end of the formal proceedings for today. Um, tomorrow we have anonymous witnesses. Sir, so tomorrow all our witnesses are anonymous, yes. So tomorrow, please, remembering my remarks at the, the start, uh, take special care when you're in and around uh, the building uh, and particularly with, with cameras or phones that take cameras, uh, that take photographs, um, not, to, uh, not to catch anyone unawares. Thank you very much.